Uh, hello and welcome to uh, content for topic 1.1. Today we're going to be talking about uh, cell size and magnification. So we'll be going through some useful skills that you're going to need to have if you're going to do well on possibly paper one, paper two questions that come up talking about uh, limitations of cell size and of course how you calculate magnification or the actual size of a cell given a micrograph or um, and an example using a diagram. All right. You shall not pass! So today we'll be focusing uh, in terms of your understandings. Uh, we're gonna have to be talking about 1.1 um, U3 here, the again, surface area to volume ratio and its limitations on cell size. And we're also gonna be talking about uh, 1.1 S1, which would be our um, talking about calculations of magnification. Uh, in terms of drawings and things like that, uh, that will come up in a later one. Um, but for today, we're just mostly focusing on uh, magnification. So obviously, we will be doing some practice, and we have already done some practice in the classroom of actually using a light microscope. Uh, you've also probably used light microscopes in the past in other scientific classrooms and other classes. Uh, the use of the light microscope is an important skill that uh, is going to continue on as you study um, biology in uh, high school and then as you go on to uh, do biology as well in college. Uh, going through the light microscope, all the different parts, uh, that's not something you're necessarily going to be um, questioned on, uh, but you do have to understand how magnification works in terms of calculating magnification. And so when we think about how a light microscope is going to magnify or increase the size of uh, whatever it is that we're looking at, uh, you have to understand what is this concept of magnification in terms of actual values and differences between the image and the actual size. And so that's really what we're going to be focusing on is those calculations. So when we're calculating magnification, uh, we basically want to know is how big uh, the image is or how much has it been magnified from the actual uh, size or the real size of the organism. And so in order to do this, uh, an image is going to be uh, supplying what we call a scale bar, uh, which is right here. And uh, with the scale bar, uh, we're going to have to uh, do our conversions. And so a scale bar has um, uh, two important parts to it. First off, the actual size of what that scale represents uh, is here in the units and numbers that are presented by the scale bar. So they're uh, 10 micrometers, for example, uh, is the equivalent of that length or the actual size concerned to the image of that scale bar. So to understand the magnification, we need to calculate uh, what it is that scale bars, the bar's actual distance is in terms of um, in the real world as you, you take your ruler out uh, and, uh, and look at it in terms on the paper or on the image. So for example here, if you were to take your uh, ruler here and we were to measure it, we would see that uh, going from this line to this line, uh, this looks to be about uh, two uh, millimeters. And um, you could do things in centimeters, but I... Or, um, all right, two centimeters, sorry. And you could do things in centimeters, but it would probably be easier if you were to convert things uh, into millimeters first, because millimeters is much easier to do conversions between uh, millimeters and micrometers, which is what the uh, unit we use for microscopic things. So in order to f do magnification calculation, you need to make sure that your units are the same. And so since microscopic things use microscopic units here, like uh, we're going to have to use um, uh, microscopic units from our um, ruler measurement here. So if you remember this calculation, uh, a micrometer, sorry, one millimeter is equivalent to a thousand micrometers. So if we have two centimeters or actually 20 mil millimeters, so it's much easier to do things in terms of millimeters, 20 millimeters would then for equal uh, 20,000 micrometers because we just take 20 millimeters times it by a thousand and now we have it as micrometers. So when we do our magnification, our equation that we use is the actual, okay, where it's uh, our 
image, sorry, our image there uh, divided by our actual. So our uh, our scale bar is our image. All right, that's what we're we're representing uh, the image with the scale bar, and uh, the the actual is going to be the label on the scale bar, the actual size the organism represents or that distance represents. So that means we would take 20,000 micrometers and we would divide it by the 10 micrometers uh, that the scale bar is equivalent to. And so then that gives us our magnification of 2,000 times. And so you don't necessarily have to write the word uh, times, you can also use just uh, a letter X. So 20, or sorry, 2,000 X uh, would be an appropriate unit when dealing with magnification. So it's always important to remember when we're dealing with your magnification, we're talking about magnification. Sorry, it's difficult to write sometimes on the screen. Uh, this equals the image here divided by the actual. So image over actual will give you the ratio of magnification. Uh, all right, so on the next um, few slides, we're gonna go through some practice uh, questions that would have appeared uh, in your note packets. So if you have this page in your note packet, um, you should have this page in your note packet. If not, um, you know, pause the video and then go, you know, print it off. Uh, but so on this page, if you want to go through these practice, uh, then you're going to, what you want to do is you're going to pause the video and uh, take a ruler, take a calculator, and uh, just go through um, each one of these examples and calculate the, the magnification that must be present uh, using the scale bar examples. And then when you finish this, uh, you can go unpause the video and then um, you can listen to me as we kind of go through what all the answers would be. All right. So you paused it, you did all your work. Okay, so first one there, uh, you might have measured this, and there's a certain range of plus or minus, you know, um, about maybe about half of a, um, a millimeter, or sorry, one or two millimeters uh, around that would be fine. Uh, but let's say you got this to be about 1.9 centimeters or 19 millimeters, then you would convert that to 19,000 uh, micrometers, divide that by two micrometers, it should give you 9,500 X as your magnification. Next, this one as well, it's the same line, but we have a different um, error bar value above. So we have our 19,000 micrometers, and if we then divide that by the actual of 67 micrometers, then we get uh, 23.5 um, magnification. Sorry, 200, 283.5 uh, magnification. And the next one, we're looking at nanometers. So if you don't remember covering this, uh, nanometers is the next smallest value from our micrometers. And so if there's a thousand micrometers and one millimeter, there's a thousand nanometers and one micrometer. So to do this, uh, if you calculate, you measured this out to be about 3.65 um, centimeters, that would be 36.5 millimeters. So let's say 36.5 uh, millimeters. If you times it by a thousand, right, that gives you micrometers. If you times it by a thousand again, that gives you nanometers. And so you should have uh, 36 and a half million nanometers. Divide that by the 100 nanometers from the scale bar, and then you should get 365,000 as your, um, your value for magnification. So nanometers are going to be used for things that are inside of the cell. So when you're looking at the mitochondria or the membrane or um, the ribosome or the Golgi apparatus, some part of a cell, that's when you would be using uh, nanometers. Or if we're looking at uh, viruses, for example, we'd also use nanometers. If we're looking at microscopic things like a bacteria uh, or a specific cell, like an animal cell or a plant cell, but if we're looking at a whole cell, uh, then we would be, should be using micrometers. So the next one, again, we have that uh, 3.65 centimeters. If we convert that to millimeters and then micrometers, we get um, 36,500 micrometers. Divided by 100 micrometers is 365. In the next example, if we measure that to be about 2.15 centimeters, or 21.5 millimeters, that means 21,500 micrometers divided by 5430x. Here we're doing a conversion to millimeters. 
or sorry, uh, the error bar size is, uh, sorry, scale bar size is quite large as, in terms of millimeters. So it's, we well, must be looking at something that actually is quite large in size, uh, not something that's microscopic. So if that uh, error bar was about 2.15 centimeters or 21.5 millimeters, uh, we would want to make sure our units are the same. So converting that to millimeters, 21.5 millimeters divided by 50 millimeters means we have 0 0.5. 4.3 magnification. So it's actually that we're looking at something that is smaller than the um, uh, the magnification is smaller than the actual image. So it's, it's something that's uh, the diagram, for example, that this is probably looking at or the picture that this is coming from. Uh, whatever it is that we're looking at is actually smaller than what it is in real life instead of being bigger than what it is in real life. And then the last one here, 50 or 500 meters, again, another example of this. So if we had 3.05 centimeters, we need to convert that to meters. So then we're talking about 0 0.0305 meters divided by 500 meters. That means 6.1 times 10 to the negative 5x. So this is obviously a very uh, small uh, magnification, very small image of something that is quite large in real life. So the, the magnification has made something very, very tiny compared to what it would be in real life. And so that's why we have such a small magnification value. Now, if you could also be asked on a test um, to calculate the actual size of something, and in this instance, they probably are they're not going to give you a scale bar, but they will give you the magnification. So here we see 90,000 X. Uh, so the X can be in front, like it is here, or it could be behind. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but they mean the same thing. But that is our, our magnification is 90,000. And so then in order to do this, we're going to have to use a different version of the magnification equation. So if you remember the magnification equation from before was magnification equals the image divided by the actual. Uh, so we know magnification and we have an image here for us. We actually want to know what the actual is. So we end up using a slightly different version of this equation, which is actual is the image divided by magnification. So magnification, this value here, is provided to us. But the actual value, i, um, I'm sorry, the image value, i, is what we don't know. And so we need to find that in order to get the actual, to uh, do the calculation to find the actual. So uh, in order to do this, what we need to do is take the diagram or the image that we've been presented and we need to, to measure it uh, so that we know the, the length of the image that's been shown to us. And normally we should do the maximum length. If they're asking you to find the width, you find the maximum width. If you're asked to find the length, you find the maximum length possible. So you take your ruler and from the furthest point on one side to the furthest point on the next side, uh, you take your ruler and you measure that. Now, uh, you might get this to be about eight centimeters, but again, millimeters is a little bit easier for your conversions. So you could do this as 80 millimeters. And then you divide that by the magnification, which was provided to you of 90,000. And so you get uh, 8.9 times 10 to the negative fourth millimeters. Now, this is not a really useful uh, number here. Uh, even though this is correct mathematically, uh, giving us values in millimeters is, uh, is kind of useless. So what you actually should be doing is making sure that you're converting this into units that make sense based on the image, uh, the thing that you're measuring. So if you're measuring something that's really, really tiny, like a part of a cell, you'd want to convert this into nanometers. If you're measuring like a bacterial cell or um, uh, plant cell or an animal cell, you would be wanting to be using micrometers. So we don't really want to use um, 8.19 times 10 to the negative fourth millimeters. We want to go through our conversion. So we would convert that to 0 0.89 micrometers. All right, timesing it by a thousand is how we go from millimeters to micrometers. And that's what we would get. Uh, and then if we wanted to even make that's really, really small value, even at micrometers. So maybe this is a very small bacterial cell. So we'd want to increase this even uh, more by converting it into nanometers. So we could times it by a thousand again, and we could get 89 or say 890 uh, nanometers. So either one of these values would uh, would be correct. You can use micrometers or nanometers. It really uh, comes down to how you want to present the information. 
but again, millimeters would be inappropriate for an answer in this circumstance because we're talking about something that is very, very small. So you should be using either your micrometers or your nanometers in your answer. Okay, so once again, these are some examples that would have been present in the note packet, and you should pause the video and go through these examples if you haven't done so already. All right, and so you've already gone through them and are ready to, to go over this. So uh, to make sure uh, you always use the line that's provided uh, to you, don't do your own measurements. Normally they have a line, um, if it's on a micrograph that they might supply to you. If there is no line, then of course you need to make a judgment. You need to decide what is the appropriate uh, length or width, depending on what the question asks. But if there is a line provided to you, use that line uh, when doing your measurements. So here are looking at a diatome that's magnified by a thousand. So if we measure that to be about 5.6 centimeters, which would be 56 millimeters, times that by a thousand makes 56 micrometers. And divide that by a thousand, uh, because of the magnification, we end up with 56 micrometers. So I know the, the math seems a little redundant there, but it's good to just go through all of the steps. So we're looking at something that's actually about 56 micrometers in terms of um, its width there, or length. You can think of it either way, it's circular. So uh, the next diatome here, magnified by 500, or sorry, 5,000. Uh, if we measure that line to be about 7.7 .7 centimeters or 77 millimeters, times it by 1,000 into micrometers, 77,000 micrometers, divided by the 5,000 magnification, you get 15.4 micrometers in terms of its length. Looking at a mosquito head here, about 200 magnification. So if you measure that as 4.7 centimeters, about 47 millimeters, which is 47,000 micrometers, divided by the 2,000 X gives you 234 micrometers. 35 micrometers, 235 micrometers, sorry. And then the hypodermic needle here, uh, if we have 2.7 centimeters, making it 27 millimeters, times it by 1,000 makes 27 micrometers, dividing it by 100 means 270 micrometers. Okay, so hopefully uh, these weren't too difficult for you. Okay, so here's another practice question you could go through. So again, you can read through it, uh, pause the video, and so you can work through it. And uh, after you've done that, then unpause the video, right? Okay, so let's say that you diagram um, a sperm cell. And so a sperm cell's flagella is actually about 50 micrometers in length, but the student draws uh, the diagram, and if you measured it, it's about 75 millimeters uh, long. So then we think, okay, what's the magnification uh, that the student's drawing is doing to the actual size of the sperm? cells tail. So if we were to kind of draw an example of something like that, and so our scale bar here is saying is about 7.5 centimeters or 75 millimeters, right? And then the value above it would be the actual value of the, the sperm's tail, which is 50 micrometers. So then you have the, uh, can make sure that you convert everything. So 7.5 or 75 millimeters, converting it to 75,000 micrometers. 75,000 micrometers divided by 50, the image over the actual, means that we're looking at a magnification of 1,500x. So you're probably thinking, why do I have to know how to do all these crazy magnifications? And uh, why are we calculating the actual size of these super, super tiny things? They're all microscopic and nanoscopic. And you're probably wondering why can't we just have just really big cells, like a cell that you can just see with the naked eye? Why can't we have a human-sized cell? And uh, in order to discuss this question about why life is built out of trillions of cells all working together instead of having one giant person-sized cell. Uh, we have to think about the factors that influence the stability or what we call homeostasis of a living thing. And so one of the major factors is what we call our surface area to volume ratio. So in order to understand this concept, first let's make sure that you understand what volume and surface area are. So I want you to imagine here we have two very perfectly cubed cells. You know, I know that doesn't really exist in nature, but let's say that it, for this example that they did. So we have uh, a small cubed cell, which is as a one by one by one in terms of its size. And then we have another one that's bigger than it, that's a three by three by three. 
So if we were to calculate the volume of the small one, uh, that would just be 1 times 1 times 1, so the length times the width times the height. That means that it has, uh, in terms of these units, it has a, a volume of 1 unit. Where the larger one, if it's 3 times 3 times 3, means that we would have a volume of about 27 units, right? So here you can see the volume is uh, much, much larger in the big cell versus the small cell. If we look at the surface area, so since it's a cube, surface area is really easy to calculate. The area of one side is the length times the width, and since all the sides are the same, then we then just times that by six because there's six sides. So then we take for the small one, uh, one times one, which is one, times the six sides, that means we would get six units. Uh, for the larger one, three times three would be nine, and then times that by six, giving us 54. And so we also see in terms of surface area, surface area is much smaller for the small cell versus the large cell. So the important thing is to think about the ratio between these two values. So if we look at surface area versus volume, there is six units for every one unit of volume. So it's a six to one ratio. Where for the larger one, it is two to one. So it's 54 uh, in terms of surface area to 27. So if we to simplify that down, that would be down to a two to one. So we have a much larger surface area to volume ratio with a small cell than we do with a large cell. And this comes from this idea that the, as volume increases, uh, it increases much faster than surface area because when we're talking about calculating volume, we're calculating as a three-dimensional value. So there's a, an increase, an exponential increase in terms of uh, changing the length and the width and the height as it increases. Surface area does increase as well, but it increases less because we're only looking at it from a length versus a width uh, and in terms of the number of sides. So since surface area doesn't increase as quickly as uh, volume does, uh, the ratio will get smaller and smaller and smaller. Basically, the volume or the bottom part of the ratio increases much faster than the surface area, which is on top. And so this creates a smaller surface area to volume ratio. The smaller the surface area to volume ratio, the less efficient the movement of material through the plasma membrane and through the cell is going to be. So the plasma membrane, as we're going to learn about um, in topic one, is very important for the importing and exporting of material into and out of the cell. If the volume is really, really, really big, there's a lot of cell that needs to be taken care of, but there isn't a lot of surface area. There's not a lot of plasma membrane that is present in order to help with the moving of material in and out of the cell. If the cell is very, very small, uh, the volume is relatively low, and the surface area actually is more than necessary in some cases in order to remove material and bring material in and out of the cell. So since the surface area is quite high and the volume is quite low, it's much easier for the cell's stability as it's transporting things in and out and maintaining, for example, metabolic reactions, all these different chemical reactions that happen along the surface of the membrane. So a large surface area to volume ratio means that a cell is actually more efficient, uh, more efficient. it's more effective at, at doing living things. And if you're better at doing living things like uh, releasing waste and bringing in nutrition, uh, releasing carbon dioxide, bringing in oxygen, right, uh, you have a better chance of surviving. So the homeostasis or the ability for a cell to survive is greatly influenced by its surface area to volume ratio. The larger the surface area to volume ratio, the better the chance for the cell to uh, be stable. So it's not just the ability for the plasma membrane to also move things in and out of the cell, but it's also the ability for things to move uh, once they are inside of the cell. So we think about diffusion. Diffusion is this passive movement of material from a high concentration to a low concentration. So once we get something inside of the cell, let's say that we had to get something from the plasma membrane right here in, on that point, and we needed to get it to the nucleus. And so to go from here to the nucleus here at the center of the cell is a longer distance than if it's going from here to here. Ah, it's so hard to draw on these things. Sorry about that. So you can see that it's a much long, longer distance. So because of the longer distance, the diffusion rate for the large cells is going to be slower than the diffusion rate for the slow cell. And so if 
things are taking a long time to move through the cell, the cell is going to have a harder time keeping itself alive. It constantly has to be taking in energy. It constantly has to be taking in nutrition and oxygen. It needs to be releasing waste material so that that waste material builds up inside of the cell that also can lead to the cell's death. So if it's a shorter distance, it's much faster diffusion, and so then it's more effective, it's more efficient for the cell in order to stay alive. So shorter distance versus a longer distance is much better for the cell. And it's much easier to maintain a concentration gradient when we're talking about a very small distance, all right? When we talk about your nerve cells and the functions of your brain uh, next year when we get into topic six, uh, your nerve cells function really, really well because they're not actually touching each other. They're just extremely close to each other. They use a very, very tiny diffusion distance as they start to communicate to each other. And so having a very, very tiny distance, it's about 10 nanometers in terms of that distance, allows them to very quickly uh, communicate with each other and regulate all of these different processes that allow you to you know, think about something and imagine it even though it doesn't actually exist and allows you to take in all the information about that ball that's speeding towards your face and decide, do I have enough time to grab the ball with my hand and stop it? Or is, there no, is it moving too quick and there's not enough distance? Uh, I need to move my face and get out of the way of the ball so I don't get hit. So all this complex information that's being taken in by your senses is being processed by your brain very, very quickly, and it's using diffusion as um, a power source or a way to allow all of this uh, constant uh, moving of material, of information around inside of your brain. And so a very small distance of 10 nanometers allows this quick diffusion. Now, that doesn't mean that being a small organism made of trillions and trillions of cells is always a positive thing. There are some negatives, right? So having a large surface area to volume ratio has problems with efficiency in which we lose heat. So we are warm-blooded animals, so that means that we try to maintain a very specific temperature that is ideal for our enzymes and ideal for our cells to stay alive. So it's about 37 degrees Celsius for human beings, right? The, the fact that we are made from many, many, many cells that are very, very tiny actually increases the loss of heat. And so in order to maintain our warmer temperatures, we have to eat a lot of material so that we can break it down so that we can release some energy as heat to make sure that we stay you know, alive. Particularly on colder days, for example, you're gonna have a harder time keeping your body temperature up. You probably are aware that you know, in, in the winter time, you maybe tend to eat a little bit more because it's colder outside, it's colder inside. You're burning through a little bit more energy uh, because of those cold temperatures, so you might be a little bit hungrier in order to keep your temperatures up, right? Uh, this is also becomes a problem with uh, desert plants, for example. Desert plants also have a faster loss of water, just like they lose, uh, we lose heat quicker. Uh, desert plants lose water quicker because they have a really high surface area to volume ratio by, by being made of all of these different cells. So what they actually try to do is they try to roll their leaves if you've ever seen a cactus, the uh, spikes on a cactus are not actually spikes. They're the leaves of the plant. They're just rolled into a spike uh, for two reasons. One is that it's a pretty good defense mechanism. You know, no one likes being stabbed with a pointy leaf. Uh, but also it reduces the amount of surface area of the leaf so that it doesn't lose water as quickly. So even though uh, it's important to have a really large surface area to volume ratio for us to survive, uh, there are some disadvantages to it as well. So when we think about having a super large surface area to volume ratio, what are the best ways to ensure that that happens? What does life do in order to have this occur? Well, one thing is the whole point that we've been bringing up is the fact that cells are super small. We're using microscopic and nanoscopic units, right? Cells constantly divide as they grow larger, right? If they get larger, if they get too big, they start to have too small of a surface area to volume ratio as they get larger, so they are triggered to divide in half uh, going through cellular division in order to, um, to decrease their uh, surface area to volume, or sorry, to, to decrease their volume and increase their surface area, which therefore returns them back to a large surface area to volume ratio that they needed. 
uh, we also could have compartmentalization. The idea that we break up specific tasks into the cell uh, that are separated by different membranes. And so the uh, functions of the mitochondria, for example, can just be uh, contained to the mitochondria itself. It's not something that's happening everywhere inside of the cell. It's only happening inside of the membrane. Here you can see the outer membrane of our mitochondria. So that helps uh, increase the surface area and keep the volume low. What we also do is we also fold membranes back and forth uh, to increase surface area. So here, the inner membrane of the mitochondria, you can see it folded back and forth. That's all the squiggly lines inside are, are, caused, are, are causing that, the folding of this membrane. Uh, you also have probably seen pictures of the human brain. Human brain is capable of processing billions of thoughts, billions of uh, pieces of information all at the same time. And the reason why that's possible is because there's a lot of surface area in the brain. And the increased surface area comes from all those wrinkles and folds of the brain. Same thing happens in your lung tissue. We need a really efficient movement of oxygen into your blood and carbon dioxide out of your blood. So your lung tissue is comprised of a really large surface area that's all folded uh, around little alveoli sacs. Uh, same thing happens in your large intestine. Your large intestine, or sorry, not large intestine, your small intestine. Your small intestine has a surface area, if we stretched it all out and made it completely flat, would be the equivalent of a tennis court. That's how much surface area is in just your small intestine. And so by folding it back and forth and having it be very wrinkly and having these little extensions that are called villi, uh, we can have this huge surface area compacted into a really small area, uh, which then allows for more efficient absorption of material. So folding also helps maximize our surface area here. Uh, we have our alveoli, we have our intestines. Oh yes, and in plant cells, we have the root hair cells. So uh, plant cells will have these little tiny extensions in their roots, all right? And these little extensions coming out of their roots help increase the surface area so that they're in more contact with the soil and can more efficiently uh, absorb water from the soil. So here's that example. Inside the small intestine here, they have the microvilli. So you can see the, the microvilli kind of poking up in this image here, right? So each one of these little tiny extensions inside your small intestine, if we were to take all of them and flatten them all out, that's where we get that tennis court size surface area inside of just a small section of your stomach, your stomach area, your abdomen. So uh, it's very important that we uh, keep cells very, very small. And if we're going to be a large cell, uh, we're going to have to be made up of multiple cells if we're going to be stable. Here, if we look at cell A being very, very small, it has a fairly good surface area to volume ratio of 6 to 1. Cell B here is a single celled organism that is quite large in terms of its cell, and it does not have a very good surface area to volume ratio of 1.2. So the surface area volume is decreasing. However, if we had this option here, being multicellular, so we take the same general size as B, but we divide it into small groups of cell, or group of small cells, we can then restore the surface area back to that 6 to 1 that the uh, first one had, that A has. So if we're going to have um, large complex organisms like you or all these other animals and plants that you see every day, uh, they're going to have to be made of trillions and trillions of cells instead of just being made of one large cell. It's the only way to keep the surface area to volume ratio high enough that everything can survive. So in summary, high rate of metabolism in cells is going to be a function of its mass versus its volume. The bigger the cell, the more metabolism, the more chemistry that's going to be needed to keep it alive. Larger organisms have more cells, they have larger cells in some cases, so that means they're going to have a larger volume and they're going to have to burn more energy to keep themselves stable. The exchange of material is going to be a function that's influenced by surface area. So if we're going to increase the size of the cell, the volume is going to increase faster than surface area, which is going to decrease the surface area to volume ratio. If we're going to have a good metabolic rate, we need to make sure, and we have to have a good exchange of materials. Uh, if the metabolic rate is too high, um, there isn't going to be a fast enough exchange of material in and out of the cell. Uh, so 
the surface area is going to be a major factor influencing the stability that's caused by a change in the volume. And so eventually the cell loses homeostasis and it dies. So best thing possible to do is for us to maintain a high or a large surface area to volume ratio. And to do that, a cell is going to have to remain small, it means it's going to have to continuously divide in order to maintain or to keep a smaller size as it increases, as it gets larger. So if we're going to have something that is going to have an efficient exchange of gas and other material, and it's going to be a large complex organism, it's going to need to have um, a very large surface area to volume ratio by having millions and billions and trillions of cells instead of individual cells. Okay, so uh, that's it for this. If you're confused, you can go back and watch it again or uh, ask me some questions, and I'll see you at the next class.